turn to our Old Testament study and come to the book of Psalms. Now, as you know, throughout this study, if, you, if you're a member of this congregation, we've been focusing on one story or principle from each book of the Old Testament before moving on to the next book. For instance, in Genesis, we talked about sin being our own fault and not somebody else's. In Exodus, we talked about obeying the voice of the Lord. Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Well, that's what we talked about. In Leviticus, we talked about the law of Moses in general and asked the question if that law was ever meant to be the law for Christians today. And then a few weeks ago, we looked at the book of Job and focused on the dangers of speaking on things without knowledge. After the book of Job then comes the book of Psalms. And as we know, there are 150 psalms. So how could I pick just one to focus on and then move on to the book of Proverbs, you might ask? Well, I am just not going to do that. And the reason I am not going to do that is, yes, there are many good psalms to focus on, but in reality, the book of Psalms should not be treated merely as one book, but one divided into five sections. Section 1 consists of Psalms 1 to 41. Section 2 consists of Psalms 42 to 72. Section 3 consists of Psalms 73 to 89. Section 4 consists of Psalms 90 to 106. And Section 5 consists of Psalms 107 to 150. Some explain these divisions as five topical sections concerning to the five books of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament. Section one includes psalms about man and creation and correspond to Genesis. Section two includes psalms about Israel and redemption and would correspond to Exodus. Section three includes psalms about worship in the temple and would correspond to Leviticus. Section 4 includes psalms about man's earthly sojourn and would correspond to Numbers. And section 5 includes psalms of praise in the Word of God and would correspond to Deuteronomy. Now, of course, this is a generalization, and not all psalms will fit this pattern, but it is an interesting way to divide this book. So what I plan on doing, the Lord willing, is picking one psalm from each section, and we do this once a month, and I'm going to give you a taste of what this book is actually talking about. The psalms that I'm going to select are not the psalms that we read all the time. We're not going to have a lesson on Psalms 23. I've dealt with that in other sermons, and I'm sure I will as, uh, in the future as well, but not as part of this series. We're not taking a look at Psalms 19. It's another good psalm, but it's a more famous psalm. We're going to look at the less famous psalms so that we can gain more knowledge about what is in this book. So, with that in mind, I would like you to turn in your Bibles to Psalms 4. We're going to read the entire psalm beginning at verse 1. To the chief musician with stringed instruments, a psalm of David. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness, you have relieved me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long, O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? But I know that the Lord has set apart for himself him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on, the bed, on your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. I will both lay, lay down, lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety.
When we read the book of Psalms, it's very tempting to read it like we would read the book of Genesis or the book of Romans. But the book of Psalms is different. Psalms are poems or songs and were originally put to music. When we do our song analysis lessons and we read through the song itself, we read it differently than we would a regular, regular piece of literature because we know that there are pauses here and there and phrases that go together that give the song its meaning. So too with the Psalms contained in this book. If you notice in your Bibles, unless you have an older version like the King James Version or a version that, that uh, contains a translation, each psalm is not written in the normal paragraph style that the other books of the Bible are written in. It's written in stanzas, the way that poetry and songs are. In particular, with this psalm, and 71 times in this book as a whole, the word Selah, S-E-L-A-H, is used, and it would signify a pause in the reading. Thus, by reading this psalm correctly, we get as close to hearing it the way we would have had the music that was played, uh, that was sung with it. And so the, the psalm itself, what I'm getting at is that it would sound as close to it as if it was sung. Before delving into the song, though, I would like to deal quickly with one issue that often comes up when studying the book of Psalms. And that has to do with what I read in the title, To the Chief Musician with Stringed Instruments, a Psalm of David. We spend a lot of time, and rightfully so, defending from the New Testament why it is not right to worship God today with mechanical instruments of music. Invariably, though, people, when they hear this argument, turn our attention to this book with its mentions of harps and trumpets and tambourines and conclude that if God accepted worship with these instruments under Moses, that he accepts the same under Christ today. But let's take that argument a little further. God accepted animal sacrifices under Moses. Does he accept such today? Not according to Hebrews 10 verses 1 to 4, for these sacrifices could not remit sins. God accepted the high priest as coming from the tribe of Levi and the house of Aaron. He did that under the law of Moses. Does he accept this today? Not according to Hebrews 6 verse 20, for Jesus is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. God accepted the temple in Jerusalem as the only place to offer sacrifices. Does he accept that today? Not according to John 4, 21, where Jesus said that man could offer spiritual sacrifices anywhere. And that's the point that people miss. The law of Moses was a physical law that was the shadow of the better law of Christ, which would be a spiritual law. For mechanical, music, uh, for mechanical instruments of music to be an acceptable form of worship to God, he had to authorize them, which under the Old Testament law he did in places like 1 Chronicles 15. What instruments did God command Christians to use in worship in the New Testament? Our hearts. That's the instrument we're to use. In Ephesians 5, verse 19, we read, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. He could have added right there, singing and making melody with instruments to the Lord, or with cymbals or trumpets, but he didn't. He said, make melody in your hearts to the Lord. All sorts of musical instruments are mentioned in the Old Testament to be used in worship to God while no mention is made in the New Testament. That should tell Christians something. Something has changed. And what has changed is that the physical law has been changed to a spiritual law, and so instead of physical instruments of music being used in worship to God, we use a spiritual instrument, our heart, in order to worship God in song. So with that now having been dealt with, 
Let's turn to Psalms 4. It begins like this. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have relieved me in my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. What a great way to start this psalm. By pleading with God, the God of our righteousness to hear me when I call. So many people pray to God and wonder if he's listening. They wonder if he is paying attention or if he is off doing something else. They don't really believe that he will hear them. David isn't wondering that. He knows that God will hear him when he calls. Why? Well, for one, David is living a life of righteousness according to the will of God. That's what it means when he says, The God of my righteousness, for no man's life can truly be righteous if it is not approved by God. But didn't David sin from time to time? Yes, he did. But he trusted in the grace and mercy of the Lord to forgive him of his sins when he repented and returned to walking in the ways of the Lord. It's the same for us today. None of us is perfect in following Christ. We will sin. But what happens after we sin is what determines whether or not we are walking righteously before God. Do we continue in sin without any thought of repentance? Or do we repent of that sin, confess that sin to God, and ask for his forgiveness? If we give no thought of repentance, then we are walking in unrighteousness. If, however, we do repent, and we do confess that sin, then we are walking righteously, just like David did. So David knew that God would hear him because he walked righteously. But he also knew that God would hear him because God had heard him in the past and relieved him in his distress. David was obviously going through some sort of problem uh, at that time, and we'll discuss that in a few moments, Lord willing. But since David had experience with God helping him in the past, he had confidence that because he was walking in the ways of the Lord then, that God would continue to hear him and help him. It's difficult to trust somebody when you are first getting to know them. You don't know what type of person they are. You don't know if they can be relied on. But as you grow in a relationship with them, that trust builds to the point you can always rely on them in times of need. That's God. When we're a new Christian, we need to learn to rely less on self and more on God. In the beginning, that is hard. But over time, as we see how God has worked in our lives for our benefit, such becomes much easier. So David had a trusting relationship with God. He asked for God's mercy that he would hear his prayer. Notice David didn't demand anything of God, but requested God to extend his mercy upon him and humbly hear his prayer. Coming to verse 2, David turns his focus on those who oppress him. Verse 2, how long, O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? There are many points in David's, David's life and many people in David's life that could fit the description that David lays out here. I'm thinking of people like Absalom or Joab. How did men like this behave? They brought David to shame in front of the people. They loved things that were worthless and spread falsehoods. Yes, David sinned and deserved some of the things that he had to endure through, but these men did not act righteously in their matters either. Absalom stole the hearts of the people away from David, the anointed king, and committed treason. While Joab killed Abner and Amasa, two commanders of the armies of Israel, that he had no right to kill. David asks in this psalm, how long will they continue to do this? How long will they act defiantly? In other words, he's pleading them with them to stop, not only for his sake, but for theirs as well. 
Verse 3 continues by saying, But know that the Lord has set apart for himself who, him who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call to him. People like Joab and Absalom thought that they were defeating David by acting against him, by acting sinfully. But they were not. For David had been set apart by God because he was godly. David's strength was only found in the Lord, and because David trusted in God, God would hear his prayers. Joab and Absalom, though, only gained their strength from that which is on this earth. And if God moved against them, they would fall, and great would be their fall. Of course, we know that both David, or sorry, that both Absalom and Joab fell by the sword for the evil that they did, while David went to his grave in peace, in righteousness, showing us the importance of following God in all things. In verses 4 and 5, David offers his oppressors some advice when he says, Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your hearts on your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Verse 4 in some versions say, stand in awe or tremble and do not sin. But whichever way you take it, David is telling his oppressors not to sin. If they are angry with him, they may have a right to be, but that shouldn't lead them to sin. It's the exact same thing that Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. What should they do? Meditate within their hearts on their beds and be still. Offer sacrifices of righteousness and put their trust in the Lord. We often sin when we let our emotions take over and control our actions. Someone might do something that makes us angry and immediately we lash out at them. That can lead to sin. If we had stepped back and thought through our actions, if we had prayed to God, then perhaps we would have acted differently. And the situation could have been resolved better. Jesus was angry from time to time with his disciples, with the people, and with the rulers of the Jews. But he never held on to his anger, and he always acted appropriately. David's oppressors were bringing David's name to shame, and that was not the way to deal with the situation properly. They should have taken some time to meditate on the issue, to calm down. They should have taken some time to offer sacrifices of righteousness to God and to pray to God. If they would put, have put their trust in the Lord as David did, they could have solved their problems without resorting to sin. We need to do the same. The psalm closes by saying, There are many who say, Who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart. More than in the season that their grain and wine increased, I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. There are always pessimists in this world, people who think that nothing good will ever happen. They're what we call half-glass-empty kind of people. That was not David, and it should not be us. Who shows us any good? The Lord shows us all things that are good. He does so simply by allowing us to get up every morning, to experience the beauties of his creation, and enjoy the associations with family and friends. But of course, for Christians, he shows his goodness in what he has done for us spiritually by forgiving us of our sins through his grace when we in faith obey his son, Jesus Christ. When we become Christians, we can have more gladness in our hearts than anything we can obtain on this earth. This will allow us to lie down to sleep in peace, for it is the Lord and the Lord alone that allows us to dwell in safety. Walking in the footsteps of God is how David knew that no matter whatever situation he found himself in, that God was with him and would protect him. Now, that wouldn't necessarily mean that he wouldn't die. But even if he walked through the valley of the shadow of death, David would fear no evil. Why? Because the Lord was with him, 
and would save him spiritually for all eternity. May we have the type of faith that David had and put our trust in God in all things. So that's Psalms 4 in a nutshell. Let's quickly then turn and learn what lessons we can take from this psalm that we can apply in our daily lives. First, we can learn that God does hear the prayers of the righteous. In 1 John 5, verse 14 and 15, we read, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we asked of him. How many of us are confident when we pray to God that he hears us? If we aren't confident, why aren't we confident? Is it because we have sin in our lives? Well, if that's the reason, at least we then know the problem. Let's now correct it. 1 John 1 verse 9 says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do we believe what God said there? Then confess our sins to God and trust that he will do what he said he would do. If sin isn't the reason that we aren't confident in our prayers, what else could it be? Well, maybe we don't know if what we are asking is according to God's will. How can I solve that problem? By picking up and reading God's will, the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly, thoroughly equipped for every good work. How many good works can the scriptures equip us with? Every good work. There is not a good work out there that we can do that is not contained in the Bible as approved of God. But we have to read it in order to equip ourselves with them. Don't know what to pray for? Jesus prayed many prayers in the Gospels and taught on prayer on numerous occasions. Paul and the other apostles taught on prayer, and we can find some of their prayers in the epistles. Even Old Testament books like Psalms give us prayers of the people of old to teach us how to pray. We can pray according to the will of God, but for us to do so, we must know what the Bible says. But perhaps it's not any of those things. What else could prevent us from being confident that God will hear our prayers? Well, perhaps it's simply we don't think he's concerned with someone as insignificant as me. Sure, he heard the prayers of David, but David was the king of, e uh, was the king of Israel. And it would be through his seed that Christ would come. I'm not a king. I'm not that powerful. Why would God care about me? In 1 Samuel chapter 1, we read of a woman named Hannah. She is the wife of a man named Elkanah, an Ephraimite. From all accounts, he is not a man of influence, but simply what we might call a regular man. The thing about Hannah is, though, she couldn't have any children, something she desperately wanted to be able to do. Starting at verse 9 of 1 Samuel chapter 1, we read, So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the, tab of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she, was in the bit and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on my affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. And Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. And Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. 
And they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, and returned and came to the house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked for him from the Lord. Who is Hannah that the Lord should hear her voice? She was a righteous woman who trusted in the Lord so much that he, she prayed for a son, but left it to the Lord to make the decision. Hannah had confidence that the Lord could hear her prayers and would be satisfied, satisfied even if the answer was no. No Christian is too insignificant. The Lord wouldn't hear them if they called upon him. So as a Christian, let us gain the confidence that when we pray to God, he hears us. And even if we don't receive the things that we desire, that we can be satisfied in knowing that God knows what is best for us. And that no matter what, if we remain righteous, he will save us on the last day. So that's lesson number one. The second lesson we can learn is that we should pray for our enemies to repent. Note here in Psalms 4 that David didn't ask God for revenge against his enemies. He called on his enemies to, be, to repent and be righteous. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verses 43 to 48, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those, th those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. It's easy to pray for those who are nice to us. It's easy to pray for our friends or our loved ones. How easy is it to pray for the one who killed someone close to you? Or someone who robbed you? Or the one who hit you? Isn't it, isn't it easier to pray that they get what they deserve? Sure. But as a Christian, we should not be taking joy in anybody being cast away from God. Before we became Christians, we were in the same boat as the thief and the murderer, lost in the sight of God and bound for hell. Yet we believed in Jesus. We repented of our sins and were baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. What right do we have to wish something bad upon anybody? What right do we have not to give someone the right to obey? And the same opportunity that we had to obey. And if they obey, who are we not to be able to rejoice with them? I've always said two of the hardest things we have to do in this life is to repent and seek forgiveness and to forgive others who have wronged us. David prayed for his enemies. He didn't tell them that they could obey God while remaining in sin. He told them how to get out of sin. That's what we should be doing. We should be praying that God open doors of opportunity to speak to those who hate us and then walk through those doors when the opportunity is given. David wanted to save Absalom, the man who overthrew him. Jesus wanted to save the people who were crucifying him. We should want to save anybody that, that will obey the gospel. So that's lesson number two. The final lesson from this morning's, uh, if I can get that one to come up, the final lesson from this morning's uh, sermon is that we need to develop a trust in God no matter what we face in this life. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, we read, For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Just as it is easy to pray for our friends, it's also easy to trust in God when things are going well. In February, our economy was pretty good. The church here at East End was still able to meet in one place. Seemingly, 
all we had to worry about was if the snow was going to prevent us from going about our daily lives. My, how two months can change our perspective. I haven't seen many people in this congregation for, in person for over 63 days. 63 days, nine weeks. I haven't seen my mother since just after New Year's. And today's Mother's Day, the first Mother's Day in my lifetime that I won't see her in person. It's been tough, and I'm going to, I'm going to Skype her later this afternoon. It's not that I'm going to avoid her at all, but it's certainly been tough. But as tough as it has been for me, at least I've kept my job. Others haven't been so fortunate. At least I've kept my health. Others haven't been so fortunate. Now, at the beginning of this crisis, I was worried that I might lose support. As of yet, I have not. But that possibility still exists because no matter how quickly our governments open up, whether it is sooner or whether it is later, the effects of this recession will linger on for many months to come. But if I lost support, I will still trust that the Lord will provide, for he always has. So for whatever struggles I faced, whether mentally, emotionally, or physically, I've never given up my trust that God is still in control and can carry us through to the other side. What that side looks like is, is yet unknown, but I'll leave it in his hands. I hope the same can be said of you. Times of trouble will often test the faith of a Christian. Will we curse God or will we trust in him more? Will we be satisfied with our blessings or will, be, or will we be seeking more? Will we look to him for our security or will we look to those in this earth? David knew that whatever ill befell him, that the Lord was with him and would carry him through. What of us? Will we trust in the Lord like David did? In closing then, if I am faithful, the Lord will hear me when I call to him. And he will hear you when you call to him as well. No busy signal, no answering machine. He will hear us directly when we approach him in prayer. But he has not promised to hear everyone. The faithless, the ones that don't follow his will, he has not promised to hear. But you can change that if you will but seek his will and obey the gospel. All you need to do after hearing the gospel is to believe it. To believe in Jesus as the Son of God and the Savior of this universe. To repent of your sins. To confess your faith. Following which you can be baptized for the remission of your sins. By obeying the gospel through faith and baptism, you're calling on the name of the Lord to save you. A call he will answer in the affirmative by forgiving you of your sins. Why won't you obey the gospel today? I'm not ashamed to own my